Hi, this is Professor Fernandez, and this is video five in lesson five. We're talking still here about continuity uh, on an interval, and we're still looking at functions when we're given the um, equation of the function. But in this example from Calculus Simplified, example 2.11, we're going to look at a slightly more complicated case, and I'm going to you know, do this for you in two different ways. First of all, I'm going to do it in the most straightforward, simple, you know, unconfusing way. And then I will go back and actually use a theorem over here, um, which I put down here. I'll review that in a minute. And that's going to require some more checking, some function composition. So that'll be a little bit more involved. But so let's do the simple way first, right? It says evaluate this limit and then using theorem 2.3. Okay, we'll sort of ignore that for the minute. That'll be the second way. Great. So I'm going to focus on evaluating this limit. Okay, what am I going to do? Well, first of all, um, I am going to say kind of like what we've been uh, thinking about before in terms of like what the limit is, right? As x approaches negative, uh, as x approaches one, what am I thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about values of x that are really, really close to one, both from the left and from the right of one. So this is going to be kind of like, you know, if I looked at 1.0001 squared plus one. Or if I looked at, uh, that would be, you know, from the right. Or if I looked at um, 0 0.9999 squared plus 1. Okay? So these are numbers that are very, very close to 1 from the left and from the right. And you can see that both of these, let me do a better job here, both of these are approximately square root of 1 squared plus 1, which is square root of 2. So that is what we think the answer is to this limit. You can see that this was very quick, it was very intuitive, and it you know, leaned on what we're thinking and know about the limit. Um, so now let's talk about the more formal way to do this using the theorem, and you'll see that we'll get exactly the same result. So let's review the theorem first. So down here, the theorem says, suppose g is continuous at c and f is continuous at g of c, okay? Then fog <laughs> is continuous at c, right? This is the composition. So this is a theorem that tells us about the continuity of composite functions. So it says f of g of x is continuous at x equals c when all of these hypotheses, this, okay? So there's a lot of stuff to check here. So first of all, if I'm gonna apply this theorem to this example, I need to view the function as a composition. So I'm gonna go back and do that first before I start telling you what all these things to check are. Okay, so here's the function up here. So I'm going to call that h of x. Zoom in a little bit here. Square root of x squared plus 1. So how do I view this as a composition? Well, let's think about what's happening here. x is being squared, then we add 1, and then we take the square root. So that very last operation is a pretty good telltale signal that the outer function, the f of x here, is square root of x. And the inner function g of x is everything that happened before we took the square root. As a check, right, f of g of x is f of square root, uh, sorry, f of x squared plus 1, which means that I would take that x squared plus 1 and I would put it in for x right there. So that would give me square root of x squared plus 1. So this is me just double checking that in fact the composition that I've created really does give me back the function h of x. And it does, right? That is the same as that. Okay, great. So we have now determined that this is the f and g that makes h of x into the composite f of g of x. Awesome. So now we're going to go back to this theorem and check all this stuff. We want to figure out that f of g of x is continuous at um, c. c in this case is x equals 1. Okay, so in order for that to be the conclusion of the theorem, I need to satisfy these hypotheses of the theorem. Okay, so now is when I'm finally going to go back and um, tell you more about what these hypotheses say. So um, there's an and here. Let me erase all this, right? There's the and. So it really it's two hypotheses. It's this one, oops, a little longer, this one, and then also this one. So we have two things to check. So the first one, suppose g is continuous at c. Okay. In our problem, this is g, and I'll just write over here, um, keeping track of all these things here, c equals 1, right? c is the x value we are approaching in the limit. Okay, so back to checking the hypotheses. 
All right, suppose that G is continuous at C. That first thing to check in our problem is translating to is G of X continuous at C equals one. Okay, so how do we figure that out? Well, we kind of go back to the previous video, right? So this is video 5.5. In video 5.4, we talked about a couple of theorems that we were able to lean on um, to determine continuity if we knew the domain and the specific function family. One of those theorems, um, I'll scroll up here, this was theorem 2.1, told us that if the function is a polynomial, which g of x is, uh, then it's continuous at all points, right? Because the domain of polynomials is all real numbers. So C is definitely one of those real numbers. So the conclusion is yes, G is continuous at C equals one, yes. And I'll just write in parentheses because it's a polynomial and is therefore continuous at every C value, including one. Awesome, so we have satisfied the first hypothesis in the theorem. Now let's look at the second one is f continuous at g of c? Okay, so first thing we have to do is we have to figure out what is g of c, okay? So question, is f continuous at g of c? Okay, that's what the hypothesis says over here. All right, what is g of c? Well, this is g of one, because c is one in this problem. And then what is g of one? Well, we'll go back to g of x, here we go. Okay, and then g of one, one squared plus one equals two. At equals two. So new question, is f continuous at two? <laughs> All right, so let's go to our f function. f of x here was square root of x, okay? So is square root of x continuous at x equals two? Oops, a lot of symbols that look like two there. And the answer again is yes. Why? Because of the same theorem that I talked about a minute ago. Um, square root of x is a power function. Its domain is non-negative real numbers, okay? And x equals two is in that domain. So by that theorem, this is theorem 2.1 here in the book. By that theorem, the power functions are continuous at all points in the domain. Two is in the domain of the function, the power function squared of x. So uh, it is continuous at x equals two. So that is another check. So we have satisfied this other check. Finally, I did mention that this was the more slightly confusing and long part at the beginning of the video. So finally, having verified the two hypotheses of this theorem, we get to conclude the then. Then f of g is continuous at c. In other words, f of g of x is continuous at c equals one, right? The c in this problem. And what is f of g of x? It is the function that we were interested in figuring out if it's continuous at x equals one, right? So that was in, essentially the same um, um, uh, question. And, you know, bonus, right? So uh, I have figured out that the function is continuous. So because it's continuous, then we know that the answer to the limits is the y value. So I get to just plug in x equals one here I put it in there, I get the square root of one squared plus one equals square root of two. That is the same answer for the limit that we got before. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna do a very, very quick review because that was, I know, a lot to digest. One of the nice things about this being a video is, of course, you can rewind it and you can revisit all the fun that we just had. But long story short, right, what happened here is that what we wanna do with this x approaching one is that we wanna be able to kind of slide it in here right? And then we want to be able to like split this up and slide it in this way. All right. Um, and this is actually something that we are going to do uh, in the next uh, few videos. This is something called the limit laws, right? So the fact that these two things, um, that these two equalities really are equalities is a property of limits, right? Uh, subject to certain requirements. And you can see some of the requirements uh, showing up as they did down here. Okay, but that's essentially what we did. And that's what I did um, in the first part of this video. I said, well, if X is getting really, really close to one, I'm just gonna jump over here. I'm gonna imagine what X squared is getting close to. That's what I did with the 1.001, 0 0.999 in the beginning of the video. 
Okay, so again, this intuitive way of looking at what a limit might equal is totally okay, and I encourage that. You should also hopefully be comfortable with, you know, ideally, with the more rigorous way to do this, which uses a theorem. If anything, it's a, you know, I know it's cumbersome, but if anything, it's a great way to review previous concepts and then to also get used to how to use theorems, right? Because there are hypotheses, there are conclusions. You want to make sure all the hypotheses are met before you invoke the conclusion of a theorem. Great. Thanks for watching.